thanks for showing up folks and um it's a it's a real pleasure to see you all again and i hope that um i can make effective use of your time so mm -hmm. megan do you want to, us to jump right in or do you have anything you want to say um you know just a little I always like to say a little bit about what um, Colorado After School Partnership is as we get going. We are part of the 50 statewide after school networks and, um, you know, CAP is in place to bring um, providers together. Uh, we offer um, trainings like what you did and thank you for doing that for us. And, um, you know, we also do advocacy um, just to keep these programs strong and going. Um, we, we do a lot. So I would definitely encourage people to visit our website, coloradoafterschoolpartnership.org. Um, and today we're doing a follow-up with Annie O'Shaughnessy, who um, did three of our um, SEL trainings in June. And today is an opportunity to come back to her and say, hey, I tried this out. It didn't work. What are your tips? <laughs> um, maybe ask some specific questions around situations in your um, programs that uh, you wanted to run by her. Um, so she is here for um, any and all questions, and thank you, Annie. Um, I will just, I'm just going to open it up for now and see if anybody has any specific questions they want to ask Annie. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask the questions, and if not, I have some here that I wanted to ask. So we'll open it up for now. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question if you have them. I think um, I wanted to ask the group, uh, you know, SEL is, is a pretty broad term and there's lots of different uh, philosophies um, around it. And I wondered, um, you know, what kind of SEL um, programming do people have in their, uh, in their programs? What are you currently using? Do you have a certain model that you're using um, that uh, your staff uses? That's a question for the group. I can go. So I'm Michelle Stewart. I'm with the Douglas County School District. And so a lot of our programs partner with everything that is happening inside of the rest of the school district. So we use second, uh, excuse me, second step uh, mm -hmm. is, is the main platform that we use. Um, but then, you know, we definitely pull from all different areas. That's kind of the beauty about our programs is that we don't have to stick to one specific methodology. We can take kind of the best of the best and incorporate it how we choose. So that's what we do. Thanks, Michelle. So Annie, second step is that one that that's when you went over, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned it is pretty popular. Um, I don't, I haven't taught it, but it's uh, you know integrated as long as it's integrated and any of these things integrated into um, a restorative approach that allows for voice around how a particular social emotional skill or norm is expressed can be challenged. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, a lot of the social emotional learning is based in a cultural context um, that is often needed, needing to be challenged. Um, and so the space created by a restorative circle, for example, um, allows students to question the definition of a word like respect, um, lets them dig into uh, what does it mean? Yeah, what does it look like to respect somebody? I think that's one of the most common uh, places where I feel a rub, meaning a rub between cultural definitions of respect and the way that we teach it in schools um, as a given that this is what it looks like and mm -hmm. this is how you treat friends. And um, I think there's a danger, there's a big danger in a lot of school programs that says it's a, it's kind of, cloaked compliance um, to uh, um, the dominant culture's perception of what's polite, what, 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 what do we want you to look like and act like in this school actually matches uh, 
the leadership's or this curriculum's definition. So I just think it's essential, especially um, uh, like here in Vermont, there's, I can count the number of um, people of color who teach here on one hand, and yet we have a tremendously large refugee population, uh, people of color from all over the world in our district. And um, yeah, it, it's, it needs to be primary when we kind of pull in a boxed curriculum that we really examine who's teaching it, what space is being created for honest exchanges um, about what it means, all the different competencies. So I just, there's a lot of articles, not a lot, but there's quite a few articles. Um, so National Equity Project has a social emotional learning and equity um, article that I think is, it's really, really important. So I'll put that in the chat. Because um, we want, you know, this is messy stuff. Social emotional learning is messy by, na by its nature. Um, and so we, we want something that's super linear and we can check boxes, um, but it's not. And so it's really helpful for us as professionals to get together and talk about this piece. So if the team, a lot of schools in Vermont have SEL teams. Um, and you think, why do we need a team when we have a curriculum? Well, we have a team to, to think about our population specifically, what they come with, what we need to honor, how do we create a space for actual authentic engagement in these topics? Went off on a tangent there, but <laughs> that's my nature. Yeah. Any comments or, or reflections on that or things that you've seen specifically in different curriculums um, that kind of raise your eyebrows or um, make you scratch your head around how it's designed. I'm, I'm always curious about hearing about the different approaches. So thanks, Megan, for, for starting us off with that question. So I just want to continue. I think this is worth doing because it's been coming up a lot lately. Um, when we talk about mindfulness and self-regulation. Um, so in that document, in that article, there's potential pitfalls um, and then recommendations. And one of the pitfalls, over emphasis on self-management and self-regulation and under emphasis on the meaningful development of student agency to lead change and contribute to new more, to new more humanizing and equitable structures of teaching and learning. So this is really alive as teachers struggle with their own self-regulation in situations. Um, there's a huge um, temptation to use the strategies that we teach them, self-regulation, to uh, quiet their anger, to quiet them down, to we want kids to keep a lid on it when their anger may be uh, just justified and needs a space to learn how to actually articulate anger constructively versus just shove it down. Um, I think that's a huge challenge of our times as to how do we give kids and adults the skills to express their anger constructively um, in a way that feels safe for the people around them and gives options. So I think we need to plan for that. Otherwise, it's all going to leak out that whack-a-mole thing, you know, that game whack-a-mole. Yep bop it down. Hey, self-regulation tool, you need to calm down. You know the strategies, here you go. And then in the recess yard, you know, in this other activity, it pops up again because uh, suppressed anger doesn't go away. Yeah. So, Annie, I, how, how do, how, can you talk through what's the, a good way to do that? Like, let's say there, there is a child who is acting out or, or a teenager acting out in a class and um, you know I one thing that you said that really stuck with me is um, to let go of what you think you know right and and just to approach every situation open with with all the different possibilities right because as soon as you walk into a situation with an assumption you're not really engaging or listening to that, to that youth. Um, mm -hmm. But can you say more about like, what, what do you recommend for when, when maybe a, a provider sees that happening or 
a teacher sees that happening um, and they know mm -hmm. that that youth has some justified, has justified anger, like how do you walk through that? Um, so the first, the, the other phrase, uh, so dropping what you know and validating the valid, validating the valid until they, their eyes look up at you. Because if you validate someone's experience enough, they will shift their eyes up to your eyes. And that's when you can actually engage with them in a constructive conversation. Until they do that, they're just mouthing off, effing this and effing that. Um, you, you, you can't start trying to process that with them. So um, it's uh, you know, first validating what you're seeing. But it's observably true. Uh, you know, you just, you just threw that thing across the room. You have some serious energy, some serious anger going on right now. I see your face is really red. You, especially with the little ones, uh, connecting the physical experience with the emotional experience. So I see that your fists are clenched. I see that your, your face is really red. This must make you so angry. And then it's the attunement. So when we talked about attuning and differentiating to so your, your, you're specifically trying to attune into their situation and validate as much as their experience as possible. And when other students see you doing that kind of fearlessly, they don't, they don't get as scared by the student behavior. Okay. So if you're, if you're, uh, so there's a bunch of kids around, one kid just loses, flips his lid and you go up to them and you say, wow, you are so angry. I see you're frustrated. Um, I see your hands. I see that you've kind of flipped your lid. This is hard. I'm with you. I want to hear. This is hard. This is what I'm seeing. And you just kind of you just stay in that place of validation until they look up to you, at somehow, and then um, give them give them some options when they look up at you. What um, I want to learn. I can't know your experience until you tell me. I don't know what's happening for you. I really want to know what's happening for you right now. Tell me when you're ready to share what's happening for you. Something big is happening for you. So it's not that, uh, how do we manage this so that we can move on? It's, you know, and, and when those big blow ups, it's all about staffing, right? Because everyone probably right here in this room saying, well, that's great, but I got 20 other kids to deal with. Um, that's true. But I've, what I've seen, if, if the students feel you really validating them, uh, things get a lot less scary for everyone in the room. Um, that's all I can say is that the other students just like are there with you going, yeah, that student's angry. We're wondering why. Instead of that student's angry and scary. We want them out of here. It's a very different uh, thing a student, a teacher can project. You've got something important going on for you. We want to hear about it. Um, and it's a we. It's like we're part of our community. So when you calm down, we want to hear what's going on. And it, I'm kind of relieved that I can make a strong case now for this because no learning's going to happen or nothing's going to move forward with some of the emotions that are boiling up right now and will boil up this fall, if that makes sense to you. Like in the past, we just like, oh, well, we need that kid out of the space because we got to move forward with our activity and, you know, boom, 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 boom. Well, now that's really, <laughs> it's just a model that doesn't work. There is no moving on because five other kids are going to join that kid. Because um, they're right in that window of tolerance, the trauma window of tolerance. So much, so many of us are, so here's the acceptable amount of stress we can, we can live within. And in a day, we go up and down, up and down. Um, but because of chronic stress due to the pandemic and the civil unrest and the violence uh, and the injustice, we're, a lot of us are up here all the time. And it doesn't take much at all to go boink right out of that window of tolerance. And that's dysregulation where we can't think straight. So when you have a whole class and a teacher who is up here in the window of tolerance, it doesn't take much. For ha it's like when someone throws up and everyone else starts to throw up. I hate to say it, but it's like, yeah. And then, so I'm kind of glad and, and I know that sounds crazy, but I'm kind of, this is an opportunity that we can't, we can't just remove that one kid who's troublesome, who's uh, actually fighting for his or her rights or his or her voice because thank god for the students who have the courage to to be agents of change right uh we can't afford to do that anymore because you're going to lose the whole ship 
you're going to lose half the kids. Um, they're going to just jump in and the teacher too, maybe along with them. So um, it, it all requires that we slow down. So that's where that pair acronym uh, plays in. Pausing, see two feet, one breath. <sighs> Modeling the breathing really loudly as an adult. <sighs> You're having a hard time. This is hard. Something is big for you right now. It's an A. A is acknowledged. So pausing, A, acknowledge. What else can you acknowledge? I feel sad for what I'm seeing. There's lots of things that are going on for everybody, but especially for you today. And then they look up at you. They see a human being who cares. Maybe they're, they're getting out of that hyper uh, arousal zone, come down a little bit. They look at you and it's like, when, when can we talk? I want to hear about your experience or are you, you feel comfortable talking about it right now? And then what are, so that's inquire is, is when they look in your eyes, what can, what, what kind of questions will reveal, um, what were you hoping for by breaking that thing or, um, and then the R is what, what do we need to do to restore your readiness to learn, to engage? We want you here. Um, what do we need to do? And then, or that really hurt when you threw that pencil at me. Um, let's talk about what we need to do for me to feel comfortable moving forward because that was scary. I feel a little bit shaken by that. And I, I know you to be a good person. So there's that, see that A back to acknowledge. So if we're all up here, it doesn't take, we, we are up here in the hyper arousal dysregulation. And then someone acknowledges us and shows us connection and we come down here and then, and then we start to make them accountable. We say, Hey, but it's not okay to throw a desk or whatever it is. And they jump back up really quickly. So we circle back to acknowledge. I see you. Do I look angry? I'm not going to abandon you. Our relationship's important. I see you as a good person. Yesterday you helped Johnny do something. But, and this is a community we need to feel safe. So let's talk about what happened. So you're always circling back to the A or the pause because that student may not respond to your acknowledgement at all and say, I threw that desk at you because you're a jackass, excuse my language or something. Um, one of my favorite words. Um, and um, you have to go back to yourself and pause. <laughs> like I want to make the student pay because they just use that word that triggers me, right? And you, you got to pause. And in that pause is assessment, if, if uh, you can remember that. It's checking in with yourself. And so, oh, uh, that word's so triggering for me that I actually have to go, go get help. I got to call my supervisor or I got to get someone else to help me because I can't be working with this child in this moment, maybe in five minutes. Um, so, yeah, I feel lucky that I've been able to worked at a school for really challenging kids um, because I just got to practice this every day, what I think a lot of teachers are going to be facing. Uh, I think it's going to be like a therapeutic setting <laughs> for a lot of different groups. Um, so. And just do this. If I talk too much, please. <laughs> too much. Okay. What else do we got out there? Annie, this is Valerie Bass, and I was just wondering, um, because it does take so much practice in order to implement something um, as important as these skills um, um, you're talking about. So how, how do you propose an after-school program and in unity with the day school program um, implement this in staff meetings or what, you know, because I just keep thinking of that this is ongoing professional development that you have to practice before the scenario even happens. So it becomes second nature, just like it is for you. You just automatically know what to say, but it's going to take, or I, I it would take practice for me to be able to um, implement um, in the calming way you're doing it because at the time of the scenario there is so much um, 
anxiousness uh, typically and that. So uh, just your thought of how this can be practiced on an ongoing basis. So when the time does occur, which as you have said, it's probably going to occur more often than it did prior to the pandemic and everything that has occurred um, since March. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your ideas on that? Um, so what I've seen in schools, um, I, I begin with the pause and I ask them to put up those posters everywhere in the school. Um, I was just in a, I'll, I'll put that in the link, a little post. It's a tiny little eight and a half by 11, but that all teachers just begin to, and from the reporting I've had, um, it really makes a transformation and it's based on a theory I have, which is kind of spiritual <laughs> in that when we slow down, we can actually access our best selves and our best selves. That's why my work is called true nature teaching, because I believe this is a lot about how remembering our best self instead of learning something new school and everything is so rushed that uh, we don't. So the first thing is I say, you actually know what to do deep inside you underneath the fear and the anxiety and everything you've been taught about punitive uh, punishment and what you've been seeped in in our culture around uh, top down authority. Uh, you have a place in you that knows what is needed that child needs. And um, if you pause and ground yourself, you have a really high chance of accessing that. So when you forget the script, it, sometimes it just does not matter if you pause. So I always think of the EMT um, and I, I tell that to teachers. So when things speed up, slow down. When things speed up, slow down. Everything around you speed up, slow down. It's like you're instantly going slower as soon as things speed up around you. Um, and you do you, you do the two feet one breath to make that happen, and then um, we do practice uh, schools with teachers. I go in and um, the 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 check in at uh, at staff meetings or any meetings is pause and acknowledge each other. Hey, nice blue shirt you got there, Manny. Looks beautiful. And uh, did you cut your hair? You're just noticing because acknowledging just means you're seen. I see you. That's a beautiful blue shirt. Um, so recognizing for them that it's, it's a way of seeing each other, even when you're online. Um, and I just break it up. So I just break it up into pieces for them and practice that in pieces. But at the heart of it is the teacher's self-regulation tools. And I, it's, it's like, I don't even have to practice the last parts of it. If they really get the pause down and their own self-regulation down, um, I have a couple quotes from teacher journals that say, wow, I've noticed I approach behaviors really differently now that I do the pause all the time. I'm much more curious. It's really changed the way, you know, than the dropping of assumptions piece. Um, so practice and I can, you know, I'm, think, I'm thinking about, I have a contract with a school to do some mini micro, um, micro webinar videos. So not people don't show up, but they're available to schools. And I was thinking about doing a 20 minute one on pair. Um, so if, if a school got that along with this poster, they'd be good to go. You don't need a big old training to do that. And I think it's pretty, pretty clear. Um, I think the, the, the acknowledged piece is tough. Um, and if you're a school leader, um, you really have to practice getting out of like PBIS mindset. Um, Com, you know, like uh, school expectation mindset. So we usually give rewards for kids who meet school expectations, right? Like keeping your hands to yourself, not talking in a loud voice, staying in line, you know, all those things. We don't give out tokens for saying the F word five times instead of 10 times. Um, and that's validating the valid. All, what's also validating the valid is if a kid's screaming out at the top of their lungs, like, wow, you have an amazing, loud, strong voice. That's incredible. It's called cognitive dissonance. It's a paradoxical intervention. Um, so within acknowledgement, there's a lot of tricks you can break down for teachers. And one of the best ways to get a kid from, from, um, from escalating and to de-escalate is to, is to jump off of the script that they've heard a jillion times. You're not meeting the expectations. It's like, 
that they don't even hear that. They don't hear most of the things that teachers tell them at all. The kids who are always up here in the window of tolerance, what they need to hear is, um, wow, like your strategy for getting what you need, that big voice, that's pretty effective. You got my attention. Even if that big voice is like telling you to screw off, you're still validating the valid and you are going to create accountability. But to, to get them to de-escalate, there's nothing dishonest about telling them that their, their huge loud voice is actually pretty amazing um, for a little kid. So I had, a, I had a principal, did I tell you this? She actually had a decibel reader <laughs> because she was uh, de designing a cafeteria. And this, there was a student, a girl, who, uh, who wouldn't stop screaming. She was in third grade. And so the principal got, finally got called in. No one else could help her. She was just going for it. So she had her in the office and she took out this decibel reader and, she, and, and the girl was screaming and she showed it to her. And the girl stopped. What is that? The, the principal said, that's a decibel reader and you are louder than an entire cafeteria full of kids. That's amazing. <laughs> the girl finally stopped and laughed and, and uh, the principal said, you know, how about you use that, help me uh, get kids in from recess today. That's an amazing voice you have there. And then R, you know, how can we prevent you using this in a way that's scary for other people? Like what ways can we help you? And uh, it's just really, really sweet when that happens. The problem is most educators think that's too soft. What do you mean I'm gonna acknowledge the loudness of their voice? Uh, I don't really get that. I don't know. We all develop strategies to get what we need. Uh, another tangent, but stories are helpful. So maybe I'll do that, Megan. Maybe I'll make a little micro training or something. Yes, yeah, she's not really cool. I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Valerie, did I answer your question? Sorry. Yes. Um, I'm just um, I'm I'm just thinking about um, also how how do you make sh you know because that consistency between the school hours and after school and that communication between mm -hmm. are so important and so. Um, how, how do you also work together with the school when you're an after school mm. program, making sure that, you know, you're all on the same page, mm. I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that came up, you know, I had two cohorts this year, year long cohorts with site leaders in Vermont. Um, and that came up again and again, that the programs that were most successful were, were most uh, closely coordinating with the school. Um, to find out who was having big challenges that day in school, um, mostly. Like just identifying them, John, you know, so whatever way it doesn't, people seem like other schools were like, yeah, t schools aren't doing it, they don't have the time. And I say, it's just a checklist. You don't need to tell us what the kid did <laughs> or what happened even. If you, all you have is like highlight uh, the kids who were dysregulated during the day or had a big challenge, um, that's going to help you tremendously know who to, who to focus on when they come into the program. So without that, that just, I don't see how you can do an after school program in these times without having some information from your school. Um, and that's a challenge for the coordination piece. Do you have, uh, identify anybody in the school who is like, a big advocate of the after school program you need a champion inside inside the school for sure yeah i i just put a question to the group um asking how how programs do communicate with the schools what how they bridge that communication i just wondered if people could share how they're currently doing that i guess right now you're not right because we're not in school but during the school year how is that, that done work? So Mandy says, we meet with administrators as well as teachers on a regular basis, face to face. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mandy, what is, um, can you type in what reg uh, regular means? Is that daily, weekly, monthly? I can just mute real quick, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so we typically, our coordinators and directors will have monthly meetings at least with administrators. 
Um, and then with our teachers, they, they really chat with teachers on a daily basis because we really, um, we really want that communication and that relationship to be strong because we want to align to the school day as much as possible and continue care. Um, and we want to check in with teachers and say like, we're seeing these behaviors, what's working for you? Um, this works for us. We really just want kids to know that they have a whole community of people who love and care about them and that we're all on the same team and it's their team. And um, so really we're, we're talking with teachers on a daily basis and that's not every teacher, of course, but, um, and then we also encourage our site directors to sit in on conferences with kiddos and teachers. We sit in on IEP meetings. Um, we work closely with school counselors and social workers and our SEL coaches. Um, so we, we really try to be a big part of that school day and, and a part of the team of care for every student. How do you connect with the teachers? Do you like catch them after like in that short time between the transfers? Good question because it's hard because mm -hmm. they're busy and you know when they're done for the day like they're just like I gotta I gotta get out of here um but usually we spend our directors go back when the teachers go back and so usually like that first week of of school is mostly of trainings and welcome back stuff so we encourage our directors to participate in those things and start to build that connection with teachers and then um, our directors will set up meeting times with them so sometimes it's a whole grade level or it's one-on-one -on -one, just kind of depending on what works for them and sometimes we do it during their planning period we can catch a little bit you know can I have 10 minutes of your planning period or um, if we can get coverage for a director they can do after school meetings with them we don't run programs on Fridays in our in our system. And so a lot of times they'll have after school meetings with teachers on Fridays as well. Thank you. Um, one question I had was on the other end. So the, the other end where is the, tra the, hand, the transfer to parents or guardians. Um, I know it was important that some of the sites uh, developed a like rituals at that point to hand off information to the parents um, that was not shaming of the student but gave indication of how the student did um, while also kind of seeing and hearing and recognizing acknowledging the parent um, and i just wondered if anyone had any thing that they did at that end of the of the day that helped with that continuity of the community of care I can talk again. <laughs> yeah. um, we build really, one of the things that our program strives for is really strong connections with our family. And so we spend a lot of time getting to know a student and their family before they even come into our program. Um, so they already walk through the door and we have a connection with them, I would say 90% of the time. So it's interesting because a lot of times we're the ones that are kind of asked to deliver maybe not so positive feedback or um, you know because we're able to get a hold of families and families respond to us um, so a lot of times we are put in situations where we have to give those daily updates and all of that um, but our staff does a really amazing job of framing it in a positive way um, you know, and, and our rule for our kiddos is, okay, you may have struggled a little bit today. We had a hard day, but you're in peak now and, and it's a fresh start and, and we're going to have a great afternoon. And if we don't, that's okay too, because I know that you're coming in from a hard day and, and we're going to work on it. And so um, it's just for us, it's just one more way to build relationship with families. So uh, we, we are asked to hand off news and updates and stuff a lot so mm -hmm. nice i think the simplest one of the simpler things i've heard is just uh, 
whatever staff is is doing that handoff um it's kind of part of their job responsibility to have one thing that that student that they could validate about the student's experience um it's really really powerful for a student to hear an adult tell their parent um not like oh he's amazing he's wonderful but like yeah just like you said mandy um it was a hard day at school and he's a freaking trooper he blank and blank you know he did these two things um which in another milieu might not seem like praiseworthy at all but for that day for that child they were huge you know so um I feel like a, a good example is we had a kiddo who used to i mean his his fuse was for sure his temper and so we were really working on that with him and um he used to run like he'd run from the school after school and y'all know after school we are not staffed to be chasing kids through neighborhoods and so um it was becoming a problem but but we didn't want to be like oh it's not working until we had tried every possible thing we could and so we were really working with him on that and so one day our celebration to his mom was he ran but only to the classroom door and he sat in the we can see him because that was what we was working on we're like you can get mad you can get upset yeah. you can separate yourself from the group but i have to see you because i have to make sure that you're safe that's my job mm -hmm. we were like dude you just ran to the door and we could see <laughs> it was beautiful and his mom was just like people are crazy but we're like that's a, that's a huge celebration because he has a right to be mad you know he has yeah. issues and and it's okay but he can't do it across the street. He has to do it where I can see him, so. <laughs> That's a perfect example. Thank you so much, Mandy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the um, bookends of the transition. This is always primary in Bruce Perry's work on trauma is how many points of connection can there be of people who just aren't there doing therapy with the student but are just connected and connecting and seeing them. It's, it's actually, when you read his work and think about it so much simpler than, than we think it is. Um, yeah, we don't, we have this, sometimes we have a really trouble, troubling, challenging child. We think it's, it's a specialist job. We, you know, their problems are beyond us, but um, they're finding just more and more that it is those many points of contact and being recognized for the little bits of progress you're making that change the kids, uh, the students' behavior over time. Pretty powerful work. So a lot of our programs, um, I think, I think a lot of programs are starting to open up. I'm not sure how many are open or still doing virtual programming, um, you know, and we're entering into our new school year with some schools opening, some haven't said yet, um, some maybe doing hybrids and probably going back and forth between the two. So um, what, are your, what are your suggestions for like relationship building and connecting when it's virtual? I know that you showed the Mentimeter, which was a way to do a check-in um, and you had some other tools like that, but what other suggestions do you have as, as we try to connect with youth virtually and families virtually? Mm. I just was, I, I'm, there's so many things, there's so many ideas out there. I just was off of a meeting where we were going over what's working and what's not working. Um, and we know that that connection piece is the most important piece for the online work um, but also how are we helping students um, kind of be agents of their own work and their own um, like the time online so it's just that whole zoom fatigue piece so having students draw for five minutes put on music um, so creating more quiet time in their Zoom piece as a, as a routine. Um, so you're not telling them, we're gonna do a mindful moment now, everyone do this and do that with all sorts of instructions, right? So the cognitive brain just gets fatigued. And so 
now we're in a space where I can't see the person giving instructions. And um, so how, what, how simple can you make it? And how um, can you weave in this downtime for drawing, um, reflecting, and then just holding it up to the screen? So the, the, you can go online and Google like how to engage students online. And there's a jillion amazing things on Edutopia and stuff. But I think what's not being said is um, as much is simplify, simplify, and um, and goofy and and like uh, like I have a group. We are each contributing a five minute little video of ourselves um, doing some kind of brain break. So this is not some disembodied person they don't know from the internet, but it's one of the other teachers in the group that they know. And so when they get online. The teacher will say, oh, now we're going to hear from, you know, Megan. She's going to show us her little brain break. Which, and Megan puts on some music and just does a little weird dance or something. It depends on the age group, you know, what they'll do. But um, pulling in other members of the community. Uh, so creating an archive, like this group is creating an archive of just five minute or even three minute brain breaks from the people they know. That's going to let the students feel this larger community. So I think what I'm saying is the tricks are there. The tricks and strategies are all there all over the internet and what I've mentioned already to create connection within the classroom. But how do you remind them that they're part of a larger community that's connected and holding them? You're going to make like that. I think that's a really great idea. Those little, those little vignettes um, from other teachers. I don't know if you can do that, but it's, it's super easy and super fun. That's my, that's my idea for the day. <laughs> that's a great question though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other people have ideas on um, what you see arising in terms of the, there's really benefits to being online that you don't get otherwise. Um, I think engagement is really easy to much, it's, it, it's pretty easy to tell. Um, if all the videos are off, I don't know, you don't know what they're doing. So how are you going to switch it up to get engagement? Um, creating a spreadsheet among your teachers to house the different apps and things that are working. I think that's key. You've got to find out what works for your kids and have some archive of tactics um, so that you're all kind of coordinated. Any, any ideas that you all have used or are thinking about or heard about that you want to bring forth? All right. I actually have the struggle kind of going back to what we were talking about previous Here, I'll turn my, I'm kind of, I'm kind of ready for the day now. So you can see me, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what we are having a really hard time with is that we did go back, uh, for the summer, which is great. Our staff is really excited. Uh, but we have a lot of brand new kiddos and I am mainly focused on the pre-K. So the super itty bitties. And this might be the first time that they're coming into our program and staff are picking the kids up at the curb. The parents aren't coming in. So the parents may have toured, gosh, a year ago, nine months ago. And so forming those relationships, normally my staff is amazing forming those relationships. So when there are trouble um, moments in the day, you know, they really can establish that trust and care and have all of those great uh, relationships and conversations with the families, but especially establishing those relationships here in the very beginning where you're reaching into the car and you're doing a thermometer check and then you're doing the health checks and you're basically unbuckling the kiddo out of their car and taking it, taking them into the building. You are not forming those relationships with the families when it is most crucial at the very beginning. And I, I can already see that that's going to be an uphill battle because the staff doesn't know the families, the staff, the families don't know us. And, you know, these are the, these are the key moments in building those concrete foundations that are going to help us, especially if we have to hurry and pull the trigger and go right back to online that, that relationship building is is not where it should be that's that's our struggle right now mm -hmm. anybody i have ideas on how to mitigate that i mean the first thing i think of is um you know a video intro where each staff person has just gives a three minute intro to themselves that you've done that 
Mm -hmm. offer that to the families. Yep. And we, we did that. And then we also did kind of the virtual tour of the room. Mm. So we took pictures and wrote descriptions on mm. this. This is the cubby area. This is what your kiddo does when mm. they first walk into their cubby area. This is their mailbox area. This is the carpet. So instead of just the quick tour of the room that they did nine months ago, we really broke down the room into each area so that mm -hmm. a parent could kind of experience the day and maybe talk through with their kiddo before before they join us. Oh, remember last year when we came, this is where you hang your coat and this is where the mm -hmm. bathroom is. So we nice. really tried to, to do some of those things and be, be forward thinking in that, but mm -hmm. it still, it still is, it still is rough. You just don't get mm -hmm. that, that connection on where are you going this weekend? What movie did you watch last night? You just don't have that time because they're in that quick car line and it's that drop and go. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas from folks about how to strengthen relationships between uh, uh, the, your teachers and your, your families? I was thinking uh, if there's a way to incorporate some silliness into that very quick little 45 second, you know, exchange and, um, some sort of humor or some sort of a ritual or like a daily question or I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Good idea. Mm -hmm. any, any musicians in your group can be playing the, the guitar on the curb? <laughs> I don't think they'd be open for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll just never forget my, my child's uh, elementary school, the principal and a couple teachers played in a little band every Friday morning on the way, you know, in the entryway of the school and um, how music really changed. It was just changed the feeling of a school to, to feel that, but yeah, <laughs> it's a stretch, but I love Megan, you know, bringing up um, those unusual and kind of personal ways that might be able to come through from staff, um, po you know, big posters that you can flash. Um, yeah, there's, this is when I, one of the reasons I think in the beginning I talked about, uh, or maybe it was my last meeting, um, one of the things, the benefit or the, the, the silver linings of this time is that because we're all winging it, people are really accessing each other and creating more task force and just, you know, what Megan's been doing today, which is what are you guys doing? And that the answer is one of the restorative principles, very, one of the very basic ones is that it's not up to us. So top down authority, non-restorative approach is actually believing you have all the answers. It's not restorative to think you have to be the expert. You can't be, especially, so now we're forced, none of us can be the expert. So therefore we have to ask to survey like uh, Castle, the SEL recommendation is all about beginning with surveying your families beforehand. What do they need? What ideas do they have? Um, what ideas do the kids have? So uh, yeah, all the answers are in the room, so-called room. We just have to create the spaces and the structure to find out uh, what we know. So it's a, cool, it's a great time for de-hierarchying de because the hierarchy is not working because the people up here are winging it just like we are. I wonder, Michelle, have, um, have you talked with your families about that? Like how you want to connect and there's just such a short time and just like acknowledging that it's not what it would have, what it normally would be. Yeah. And they, they know from all of our communication that we have been really trying to do some fun things over the summer. So they've seen mm -hmm. some of those different, uh, interactions that we've done, um, and they know that we typically do, you know, parent advisory boards and all of those things where we try and get the community to come for bagels and coffee with mm. the teachers and, you know, do all of those things. And so that's kind of in our to-do list. And they know that those are hopefully upcoming, you know, maybe they might look a little different where we don't actually get to sit down and do coffee, but maybe it's a zoom coffee or a, you know something so they they know that we have hopes and you know mm -hmm. unfortunately being in douglas county right now everything is all over the place you know the board meeting last night really didn't lock in what we can do to help our families for 
for the coming weeks. So they, they've all been very patient. <laughs> Hmm. I think um, I wonder too if, if this I mean I think this is how the world feels right now right like we just cannot connect the way we used to and uh, and and we're all missing that you know and it's uh, it's just really difficult to to get that in just the short amount of time of of all of our interactions, you know, even like the grocery store, like I'm in and out as quickly as possible and I don't engage the way I used to. And it's just, mm -hmm. yeah. Has anyone seen that video of the two kids um, who are uh, finally allowed to hug? Mm. And they just get overwhelmed and start crying. It's really, really powerful expression of how we're wired to connect and that we're not allowed to and how rough that is. So um, really allowing ourselves to acknowledge that for the students and give them opportunities to express um, well wishes. So I think of in mindfulness, there's the loving kindness practice where, um, and, and this is translated to school rooms in um, one, one teacher had a, uh, like a kindness board. Who do you want to express kindness to? And so online it could be, um, there's lots of different ways you could do that, but technologically, but giving them more time to express their affection and, you know, warm feelings towards each other, I think is really going to be important too. Um, cause they can't do it physically. They can't play like they used to. Yeah. It's a somber note. Are there any other thoughts, comments, questions, questions for Annie, for the group from anyone? Well, it's been, um, I have to remind myself all the time in particular that I'm winging it as well. Although of course, what's really fun is that there's with technology, there's so many webinars and you don't have to look far to, to get, cause we all have our fascination, right? We all kind of have our area of what our work that we just we're drawn to. And I just encourage you to not only let yourself to be drawn to what your gift is, but then how are you going to share it? So understanding that the people in charge are winging it and that you have a particular gift and that, and I'm using that word like a particular area that really fascinates you and you feel a connection to, and we're not used to having as many opportunities to share that, but I'm finding that people need and colleagues need space and time to share their gifts and they're and they're clunky at it because they're not used to raising their hand in a staff meeting and saying i've got a great idea listen to me everybody um, but that's what we need so if you're a leader and you need to find answers um, we first have to create the conditions to let people do that and it might be anonymous suggestions because my experience is like just just now I was in a in a zoom meeting and the person leading it their their connection was really bad and it was just hiccuping all over the place and it was it's a it was a college and I'm new to it um, as a teacher and everyone else are veterans and so she she stops talking and every, everyone's looking at each other you know just in the screen and I unmuted and I'm like so just to let you know uh your connection's really bad and I can't hear you and everyone else is like Oh, thank God for saying something. And I was, it just struck me how these professionals were so un, unwilling to uh, be impolite and say that the connection was bad. And it just was really a signal to me of how scary it is for people to say what they've, they're thinking. So um, as you explore your little area of fascination and interest, um, remember, how are you going to express your ideas? I mean, uh, Mandy and Michelle and I'm sure Valerie and Manuel have ideas that are important to share. Um, 
how can we create those conditions? That's what our success depends on, actually, is agency. <laughs> well, I have an um, uh, ask of the folks that are here today. We um, CAP is going to be providing more trainings coming soon, and we want to get them scheduled for a time when we know that your staff can attend. And so we did create a survey. I'm just going to put it back here in the um, Zoom group chat, if you wouldn't mind um, copying, pasting that, and just either giving it out to your programs or filling it out on behalf of your programs um, so that we can get uh, more trainings out to you all. They are free, and we're probably going to just keep them virtual for a while. Um, you know, one nice thing about the virtual trainings is we can, we can reach a lot of people in a lot of different areas. You know, we are statewide network, so um, I'd be appreciative if people could take a minute to fill out that survey. Um, and thank you for this time and, and reminding us that, you know, we were like, I love that phrase, we're all winging it here and, and everybody's um, doing the best that they can. And we're all relearning, we're all learning this together, right? And mm -hmm. um, just remembering to pause and breathe and Um, can I uh, end with a poem? Oh, Before yes. you do that, Annie, um, Megan, yes. should we also share that um, uh, the next uh, Coffee with Cap is not going to occur in July? I'll let you go ahead with that. Okay, yes. So we, we're going to... Um, we're going to wait to get the results of this survey so that our future coffee with caps can be scheduled at a time when we know people can come because we have noticed not as many people are attending and we think it's probably because programs are back in session and this time just isn't working. Um, so we're not going to have the July, we were doing every other Tuesday in the morning, so we're not going to do the next one and we may wait until school resumes before we get them going again. Um, but we, you know, we hope, our goal is to bring people together from different um, agencies and, and just kind of share resources and ideas. And um, so we hope to get it resuming again, maybe in mid August when school's back in session. Maybe our first one is just, how's everybody doing? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I just read the poem, read the poem I chose and you know, ever do, I don't know if you're a poem reader, but do you ever do that and think, no, it's not a good poem. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it anyways. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> sometimes. Um, anyways. Um, life comes as is. No warranties. No extra button sewn inside the sleeve. No spare tire in the trunk. The twists and turns of circumstance or illness catch us unaware each day many reasons to despair lament or forget the reason we are here and yet despite the odds the flame inside each one of us burns true so anyways thank you so much for showing up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all Take right care. should we do the group goodbye I like yeah that. <laughs> even though there's only so few of us everyone unmute Unmute and say bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.